Hi guys, uh, my name is uh, Rick Pendleton, as you would have heard. I am a, uh, a coach here at Brisbane Grammar Boys School. I'm fortunate enough to be working in one of the premier swimming clubs in Queensland, if not Australia, under the guidance of some of the country's best coaches. I suppose one of the reasons that I got this position and what I would attribute as one of my strengths as a swimming coach is my passion for the water. Now, as human beings, we are born with two very big, very large, very powerful legs, maybe not in my instance, and it's been, you know, it's the reason that we can stand upright, run fast, and change direction at any given moment. And it's probably paid a factor in our dominance as a species. Now, when it comes to the water, this couldn't be less true. Water is 784 times more dense than air at sea level. We were not meant for this medium. It is not our natural environment. We certainly weren't meant to be able to move fast in it. So I see the relationship that humans have with water as almost magical, a form of moving artwork, if you will. And if you've ever seen an Olympic athlete race before, you may understand what I'm talking about. They seem to be able to just move through the water with such ease and speed, you know, such grace. As a swim coach, I find it so rewarding now that I can provide insight, encouragement, and training skills for people to be able to achieve this kind of purity. My idea is about learning from, trusting, and believing in the power of your choices that you make in life, successful or not. My insight into this will come in the way of sports and growing up with a disability. I will look at the process of making choices, the mindset I believe should be associated with such things, and finally, dealing with the outcomes. Well, with such a broad topic, I mean, where would we begin? Well, a few definitions of intersection are the act or process of intersecting or a place or area where two or more things intersect. All right, well, what, well, what does intersect mean? Well, that can be defined as to pierce and divide by passing through or across or to meet and cross at a point. All right, didn't realise this was an English lesson. But, but what does that mean? I mean, is this even relevant in today's society? And if so, are you faced with it on a daily uh, basis? Literally? Yes. I mean, I'm sure on your way in here today, whether you're travelling by car or by foot, you would have passed through an intersection. But I don't think that's probably what we're referring about. So it's safe to assume that they're talking about significant events and times in our lives where we are faced with a decision that could greatly impact or alter the course of our life. So my, the first decision that I can recall making that was of any great significance came when I was in year eight. I started swimming when I was 10 years old when my school came up to me and asked me if I would compete for them at an upcoming regional championships in a multi-class event. Now, as a young hyperactive boy, I thought, eh, sure, why not? I'll have a go. And any opportunity to get out of a day's school was a good idea to me. So I went along and raced and, you know, I didn't think too much of it. A couple of weeks later, though, my mum got a phone call from the school letting them know that I actually achieved a state record at that meet. So you can see how she was pretty keen on getting me in the water after that point. But it'd take a few years for me to come around. I suppose it's not much of an issue, you know. Plenty of people do multiple sports or stop one sport to can take up another. But that's not me. Firstly, I grew up in a family that was rooted in rugby league culture. My father was born in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and was a mighty Roosters fan, if I may be able to quote him. My mother was born in Padso and was a South Sydney Rabbitohs fan. I'm one of seven siblings with four older brothers. I'll give you one guess as to what sport they're all into. I mean, given what I know now, it was a fairly easy decision. But at the time, I was going against the status quo of my childhood. You know, who knows? Maybe I did go the other route. Maybe I'm a famous footballer in another timeline. It's pretty unlikely. You don't see too many one-handed guys running around the football field in a game dominated by hand ball handling skills. Now, maybe I went the academic route. Who knows, maybe I'm even a millionaire somewhere. But no, I chose swimming. And it wasn't the money, the fame, or the glory that sort of swayed my choice, but rather the fact that I found with a team sport, my outcome could be determined by the kind of game my, my teammates had, whether they trained and prepared well that week, or even if they wanted to be there in the first place. The fact that they were all growing and, well, as you can see, I didn't, may have swayed my decision as well. But regardless, you know, that was unacceptable to me. I wanted to succeed and I did not want other people to be accountable for me. 
Soon after starting swimming, I realised that being good wasn't much of an option either. I wanted to represent my country. I wanted to be the best. So, I flipped a coin, jumped in both feet, committed completely. I chose my pathway and everything that came along with it. You could say it was my mother that chose for me, but you'd be wrong. She kindly asked me at the start of every year if I'd give swimming a go, and finally I got to the point where I just thought, well, what's the outcome here? You know, I looked at both options, weighed up their importance, their practicality, their suitability. I made the first decision of my life that would determine where I am today. This was a, a physical crossroads, okay? So the decision that I made to swim directly impacted my future, okay? I mean, just think about that for a second. A decision that I made at 13 years of age to swim has me standing right where I am today. The fact that I would go on to represent my country, win a gold medal for my country, all because I made that choice. Now, it doesn't seem like much of a decision, does it? Could this really have as big an impact on our life as my first example did? I would say yes. So one of the um, first stories I want to talk to you about is uh, not something I really talk about very often. Um, in fact, my wife of six years only heard this for the first time a couple of weeks ago when I started doing this speech. Uh, but I suppose in this context, it kind of exemplifies what I'm trying to talk about. Now, as a young boy growing up in the hustle bustle of inner city Sydney, you are constantly faced with an ever-changing cultural norm. Now, as a person with a disability, this can be even harder to navigate, as having a distinguishable difference can make you a target for ridicule and judgment. This didn't sit overly well with me, but I had a plan. It was either put my hands in my pockets or simply by wearing a long sleeve jumper or shirt. As it doesn't pose too much of an issue in wintertime. However, in summertime, when the temperatures are at 35 to 40 degrees in summer, you can imagine this is starting to cause some issues. One such day, I was with my best friend in a bank, and it was a reasonably humid day, and it was quite stuffy inside the bank. I started feeling a little bit off, you know. Now, not having had this happen too often before, I wasn't sure what was going on. But I understood well enough that I needed to find somewhere to sit down. So I quickly scanned the room and noticed a, a chair in the corner and started making a, a beeline for it. The next thing I realised, I wake up on the ground looking at the roof with my best friend and strangely enough my uncle and auntie standing over me. I get rushed to the hospital and have eight stitches put in my head. Apparently as I was fainting, I've caught the corner of a, a concrete pylon and split my head open. Now, over the next few years, I, like, I struggled relentlessly with this issue, knowing full well that I was causing irreparable damage to myself, but just not being overcome the fear and embarrassment of people seeing me as I am. Soon after this incident, my mother took me to see a doctor, um, and they strapped like an ECG machine on me that I had to wear around for 24 hours to figure out what was going on. And when the results came back, nothing apparent seemed to show up. But the doctor said something at the time that I will never forget. He said something about a cooked hypothalamus. Now, for these, those of you that don't know, the hypothalamus is the center of the brain, which, among other things, controls body temperature. Now, I'm not a doctor. I have absolutely no idea if that's an actual condition. However, still, to this day, I have fainting spells that can be triggered by heat, lack of food, lack of sleep, dehydration, or simply just by standing in a crowded place. Now, coming to the point, I don't recall when I decided that this needed to change. But a situation that always really spiked my fears was going to a shopping centre like a Westfields and walking around. You know, at first it was really hard for me to go there without a jumper on. But over time, I've managed to be able to walk around there as I am. And as I said, this, this wasn't a, a precise moment in time that I can pinpoint, nor something that I can, you know, really figure out if I even thought about it. But this was a decision that I made for my own wealth and well-being. Now, can you imagine that same boy standing here on this stage doing a talk right now? He would be absolutely mortified. I doubt he'd come out on stage. And if he did, there's half a chance that he'd just faint on us. I actually learned through the process of doing this speech that this is a known as glossophobia for you, those of you that are interested, fear of public speaking. 
I mean, I still get nervous to this day, and I find myself, you know, reverting back to my old habits of putting my hands in my pockets. This was something that was like so rooted in my personality for so many years that I now have to overcome subconscious actions seemingly by force. And I hate that. I absolutely hate that I was like that. I cannot believe that I would put myself in such a dangerous position, you know, that I would allow those feelings about myself the proud, defiant person that I am today. But it has taught me a lot. My second point is about mindset when we're faced with these crossroads and the decisions that we're making. As you can see, I had a pretty negative opinion of myself and I allowed that to affect my choices. It wasn't until I was prepared to accept that I wasn't perfect, that I couldn't control everything and every situation, and that sometimes people are just going to be ignorant and rude and hurtful. But that's not my point. I chose to my, put my feelings, my opinions, my wealth and health, uh, health and well-being above all of that and accept myself for who I was. Now, I think ultimately, when you're making a decision, you have two options, all right, for the positive and for the negative. How you come to that decision is just as important, though. Now, when I was trying to get through this personality trait, I had to talk and will myself into it. After all, I think you will always have trouble sticking to a decision if you do not 100% believe in your reasoning. And this can be hard. I mean, human beings are blessed and cursed with an array of emotions and feelings. Now, things like anger, resentment, love, hate, passion. I mean, the list goes on. And as an audience comprised of a lot of younger boys, but even adults and people of different races and cultures and statuses, you know, I'm sure that you are faced with situations on a daily basis where your, your resolve is tested and you would know firsthand from experience just how hard these embedded defences can be to overcome. I think if we can use, you know, calm, assertive and positive mindset to lead our thoughts when we are making these decisions, I feel like we can come out on top. Now, I had recited earlier that intersections could be defined as to meet and cross at a point. Well, what happens to this other timeline that could have been? Some would say it just doesn't exist. Others may argue to the end of the earth that there's now an alternate reality, branching off into infinite timelines of all the decisions you've ever made. But we're not really here to talk about that. Having said that, I bet you you don't stop yourself from often thinking, well, what if I did this? Or what if I went that? You know, it's human nature to wonder and I'm like, I get it, you know, because not every decision you make is going to be a good one. Following my uh, career highlight in Beijing, uh, I was left with another fork in the road. Now, as a performance athlete, we are hyper-focused on achieving a singular goal, one which could be years in the making. Now, what happens when you achieve that goal? It's not heard of very often, but after a games or a very big event like that, you were left with this really eerie feeling. Okay? Regardless of your outcome of that game, you've come to the realisation that there's actually not a whole lot else going on in your life that's of any great importance. Coupled with the fact that you've just spent a month or so or more with 30 or so individuals day in and day out doing the exact same thing as you to now pretty much being at home all alone, all by yourself. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, like I said, it's a very odd feeling. I recall one day, I was in my backyard only two days after I got home from uh, the Paralympic Games, and once again, here I am laying on my back, looking up at the stars, and I was just overcome with how big this place is that we live. You know, we make these boxes in our lives that define who we are and keep us, you know, the centre of the universe, and at this point, everything disappeared, and I was just left with this enormity, like it was a, a crushing feeling. And I, I just, I needed to fill the gap somehow. So this is when I decided that I was going to try qualify for the Commonwealth Games in 2010, which I'd never done before. And for you, those of you that don't know, the Commonwealth Games only host a certain amount of Paralympic events known as exhibition events. And in this instance, they happen to be the 100 freestyle. And I'm not a freestyler. So I flipped the coin, jumped in, both feet, committed completely, and I chose my pathway and everything that comes along with it again. Didn't work out. Not only didn't I make that team, 
I actually failed to make the Australian team that year as well, as my new training didn't really work too well with my main stroke. So I was left with another, a crossroads, you know, quit swimming or do something drastic. So I did something drastic. That's when I moved to the RAS in Canberra to continue my training. I had to leave my hometown for the first time in my life. All my friends, my family, even my current girlfriend, everything that kind of represented and connected me. Worst choice ever. <laughs> Not only didn't that work out, I only lasted eight months down there. I missed the Australian team the following year. My girlfriend left me. She stole my dog. <laughs> I badly injured my knee, and I pretty much retired from swimming for four months. So as you can see, not every choice you make is going to have a positive outcome. I mean, I can look back in hindsight and I could once again think, you know, but, but if only. My final point rounds out the, uh, my talk and intersections is dealing with the outcome. Now, I try to live by a few mottos in life now. Love yourself for who you are, never regret, never forget, and never go backwards, which would explain why I hate backstroke so much. <laughs> now, these... These things often intermingle and overlap. I did explain to you before about my story about growing up with a disability that you need to love yourself for who you are, regardless. Okay? Never regret, never forget. If you love yourself for who you are, then you shouldn't be you shouldn't feel bad about the things that have happened along the way, good or bad, for those choices that you have made are the reason you are who you are today. The never forget part is pretty important. You know, this indicates that you're not a complete sociopath and that you can still feel remorse and sadness for some of the things that happen along the way. Never go backwards. If you love yourself for who you are, you don't regret the choices that you've made and you haven't forgotten your mistakes, then there's no reason to go backwards. You know, your life is ahead of you. Your next choice is ahead of you. Your next intersection is ahead of you. I look back on my pathway and all the key moments in my life and I love all of it. It has been so rewarding to make those choices, even the wrong ones. You know, I envision a pathway where I can see all the good parts and the bad parts of my life and I'm amazed with where my life is today. You know, I've been to four Paralympics. I've been on the Australian swim team for 15 years. I've been a gold medalist. I've been a world record holder, the fastest person in the world. I've received an Order of Australia medal from the Governor General of Australia. Most importantly, though, I have a wife and two beautiful children to go home to every night. You know, it's poetic, and it's comforting to know that in the end, everything will work out okay. And if there's one thing I can leave you guys with today, it would be this. Take every opportunity you can to make a decision. Do so wholeheartedly and without regret. And to love yourself for who you are and where you are. And hopefully one day you can look back and smile. Thank you all for letting me come in today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you.